Good morning. Now we do have a few announcements. Uh, if you're a visitor here with us today, there are envelopes or cards in the chairs in front of you in the backs. If you would take one of those and fill them out, please, and then go ahead and place them in one of the boxes toward the back, uh, we would appreciate that. Also, um, we have some envelopes going around through the church right now. Uh, and because of that, we're not going to be passing the offering plates today. Uh, so if you did bring your, your church offering, uh, just go ahead and put that in the boxes uh, toward the back of the church also. Um, <clears throat> all life group leaders, please meet right after the service uh, here, up front here, um, for an update. Christmas Eve service will be Sunday, December 24th, next Sunday at 6 p.m. All kids, fifth grade and under, are welcome to come for a Christmas Eve pajama party next Sunday, starting at 9 a.m in the kids' Sunday school room downstairs. This will last through our regular service time. So kids, fifth grade and under, come in your pajamas. You're having a party downstairs next week. Um, only other thing that today is Pastor Shane's birthday. And he bailed on us. So we're going to sing happy birthday anyways. And we'll have it on, on hopefully on the video that gets posted. So let's uh, go ahead and sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Ready? Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Shay. Happy birthday to you. Let's all stand and we'll do our monthly memory verse. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Luke. 2.11. Father, we just uh, thank you for this time. We thank you for your many blessings. We just uh, uh, give you praise for um, the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, who we're celebrating during this time of the year. And Father, we just ask that you would continue to, to just guide and bless us as a, as a church body as we move forward. We just thank you for all in Jesus' name. Amen. Week three, we light the candle of joy. Our hope is sure. We have peace with God, and the Messiah is coming to set the world right. Tears will be dried. Hearts will be mended. Bodies healed. Relationships restored. We are treasured sons and daughters of the Most High God. Our response to this amazing love and goodness is joy. Hear joy. When the Lord restores the captives of Zion, we were like those who uh, dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then they, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our captives, O Lord, as the streams of the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed to sow, shall come home among uh, with joycing again with joycing, bringing his grain sheaves with him. Psalms 126, 1 through 6. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to preserve those who mourn in Zion, to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, 
the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. They shall build the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Isaiah 61, 1 through 4. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire inhabited earth should be taxed. This taxation was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own city to be taxed. So Joseph also departed from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, in Judea, because he believed, because he was the house of, and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary before his betrothed wife, who was with child. So while they were there, the day came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 2, 6-7. through seven. And in the same area, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were very afraid. But the angel said to them, Listen, do not fear, for I bring you good news 
of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a, com a company of the heavens hosted, praising God and saying, glory to, the, glory to God in the highest on, and on earth peace and good will towards men. And, but Mary kept all of these things and protected them in her heart. Luke 
Into us, for into us a child is born, into us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Peace, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. Good morning, whoa, all right. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, let's start with a round of applause for Jennifer, Ryan, Caleb on the drums, and everything they did to put this together this morning, so.
So one of my favorite uh, Christmas songs is written by, or sung by Andy Williams, and it's, uh, it's called, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. And when you get shows like this, this morning, um, when you see the Christmas spirit, the lights, um, everything that goes on, if you're like me, you do believe it's the most wonderful time of the year. This is actually one of my favorite times of year. Um, but we as Christians, we celebrate something bigger this time of year. We celebrate a birthday, right? And it's not just a birthday. It's the greatest birthday of all time. And if you're like me, you have a nativity scene in your house or perhaps in your yard. Um, maybe you have ornaments uh, that show the nativity that you hang on the tree. And of course, the central focus of the nativity is the newborn baby Jesus. But there's other characters in that nativity. There is Mary, which Shane talked about last week, the Magi, uh, you have shepherds, some nativities have an angel, and there is a kind of a forgotten guy by the name of Joseph. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. A few months ago, Shane asked me if I would fill in today. And being as it's his birthday, and it's the, Chris, or the kids program, now I know why. Um, so, but uh, he told me he'd be doing uh, a series on the nativity, and he asked me who I'd like to preach on. I said, well, I'll take Joseph. And uh, which he was okay with that. And so as I started digging into the scriptures, um, I found out there's not a whole lot about Joseph in the scriptures, uh, at, at least on, on maybe the, on the surface level. Um, we were unsure of his age at the time of Jesus, uh, at, at the time of Jesus' birth. We're, we're unsure about when he died, although we can gather from the words spoken by Jesus on the cross that he was probably already um, deceased by the time the crucifixion took place, and we know that he's a carpenter. That's about it as far as a direct message of what we have from Joseph until we dig into it a little bit further. There's also some extra biblical um, writings on Joseph. There, I believe uh, there are books in the Apocrypha that focus on um, Joseph when he was raising Jesus. Um, or at least parts of them, and then there are some biographies on Joseph that are extra biblical. But I, I really wanted to keep this based solely on the scriptures and what um, what God wants us to know about Joseph. I, I feel God reveals what He wants us to know in His Word, and I think we can find more out about Joseph. So, um. I struggled with that for a while because I, I went into it asking, who is Joseph? And that's, that's tough to, to answer. So I shifted focus and I instead asked the question, why Joseph? And that's why I chose the title, Why Joseph? Because we know that Joseph was chosen to be the adoptive father of Jesus. Maybe the better question is, why did God choose Joseph to be the adoptive father of Jesus. Why did he, what did he see in Joseph? That he said, this is the man that I want to task with raising my son. So let me, let me state that I have no experience whatsoever in being an adoptive father or uh, choosing adoptive parents, right? I, I, you know, we could tr I could try to go to um, the answer of all things, right? Google and ask, what makes a good adoptive parent. Um, but I think that's missing the point because I think what we're really trying to do here is understand why God chose Joseph to, for this job. What characteristics would God look for in a father to raise his son? Now, remember, when, when he's choosing this, this guy to, for, this, for this task, we're not talking about any kid here, right? I mean, we're talking about changing the entire course of history, saving mankind of their sins, level of importance of a kid that you're going to be tasked with raising. So, um, so I, think we can, I think we actually can find these answers in the scriptures. The Bible has what are often referred to as two birth narratives of Jesus. 
Um, one is found in Matthew, the other in Luke. The kids um, helped us through the, the Luke message today. Um, I think the Luke mess, the narrative actually focuses more on the divine revelation to Mary, and the Matthew does focus more on the, the revelation to uh, Joseph. So that's why I chose uh, Matthew chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, um, or as Shane says, the soft glow of your device, let's go ahead and open them to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 is what we'll be reading in. I, I think this does actually tell us quite a bit about um, Joseph and who he is and why God chose him. So there we read, starting in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Let's stop there because I think there's a lot to unpack here. So um, the first thing we need, to, we need to understand is what a betrothal even is. Um, basically, marriage had three steps. Step one would be that the families would come together and agree that their children would be married, typically the father of, of both. Um, now, just so you know, if anybody doesn't know, this is, a betrothal is nothing like our Western steps to marriage. Um, I'm going to sidetrack here just for a second. Young men, Caleb, you were here playing drums. I see a few of you. Um, in, in our traditional way of marriage, after dating, the man goes to the father and asks permission for his daughter's hand in marriage. As a man that has two daughters, I'll say... For safety concerns, men don't skip this step. This is very important, okay? And if there's other guys out there, I know you're like, really, I brought my kids to have them threatened by the guy at the pulpit? No. But um, this is a very important step. So please, young men, don't forget that. But a lot different than what a, a betrothal is as far as in Jewish culture because um, the process basically began um, when there was a financial agreement in place between the two families. Um, I guess in simple terms, you could say that the father negotiated, in essence, a cost to purchase his daughter. I know it sounds horrible. Um, and as the dad of two young, young ladies, and um, I'm sure they think that sounds horrible, but that's, that's just the way it was. So um, keep that in mind. So step two would be that uh, once the price is settled, um, it could take place, the betrothing could take place, uh, public announcements made, and actually, unlike an engagement in our culture, at that time, legally, they are married. So um, that's very important to keep in mind here because, well, we'll come to that here in a second. So about a year or so goes by of the, of the betrothal. Um, the bride actually continues to live with her family while the husband uh, basically kind of secures a stable living for them to be able to live together. Uh, but if you break the betrothal, so if you, if you break an engagement, you can just break it off. If you break a betrothal, you actually had to have a divorce at that time. And, excuse me, the way that that could be done is the groom could simply write up a certificate of divorce and present it to the, to the bride, the prospective bride. Um, and then that was, that was it. I mean, you know, a few other things had to be done, but it actually it was, it was very common, and, and so it, it was, it was kind of simplified. Um, and then, of course, step three, after the, after the betrothal period is over, the bride moves in with the groom, the marriage is consummated, and they begin their life and their family together. So, Now, the scriptures tell us that the families had already come to an agreement, right? It says, um, it says when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. So they're in that betrothal period here. Um, the scriptures tell us that Mary is to be found with a child from the Holy Spirit. And we continue to read that Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to, to divorce her quietly. So we start to understand from, from this point what this man, Joseph, the characteristics that, that God sees in this man. Because Joseph is a man of integrity. So by law, by Mosaic law, he can't go through 
this marriage, right? She's been unfaithful. She's, she's pregnant. Um, he knows that he's not the father. And so by law, the just thing to do would be to divorce her. But verse 19 tells us that he decides to divorce her quietly and so as not to shame her. So we can, you can kind of see things about Joseph here because what, what it shows is that he's fully just, right, in his decision to divorce her. That's what the law says. He says, I, I need to divorce her. But he also says, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to shame her. Um, so he shows that he's just. He also shows grace and mercy in his decision. And Shane asked last week, he said, what is mercy? He asked us. And he said, mercy is, of course, um, not getting what you deserve. The opposite of that is justice. Justice is getting exactly what you deserve. So Joseph is able to accomplish both things in his decision. He shows justice because the law states that he should divorce her because she's been unfaithful. He also shows grace and mercy. Um, and by not publicly shaming her, he actually keeps her possibly from physical harm. I mean, one of the, one of the things about unfaithfulness was you were subject to stoning if you decided to go through a, a trial. And so um, he shows justice and mercy. He shows truth and grace. These are qualities of the kid, I say the kid, the child, that he's going to be tasked with raising. You start to see why God chose Joseph for this position because he's already showing, he's already showed the qualities that his son, or that God's son Jesus also showed. So that's one of the things. Let's continue. Uh, Matthew 20 through 23 in the same chapter says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, Joseph has already decided to divorce Mary, and he goes to sleep. And an angel appears to him in a dream and basically says, do not divorce Mary. The baby she is carrying is from God, not from another man. It was conceived from the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a boy. You are to name him Jesus. Oh, by the, and oh, by the way, this boy is the promised Messiah who will grow up and save the people from their sin. I think something very intentional that God does in this dream to Joseph is he calls him the son of David. You see, God's pointing out to Joseph and to us, the, the reader, that uh, Joseph is a legitimate son of David. You can see that through his genealogy. Now, to fulfill prophecy, the child Mary is carrying must also be a legitimate heir to David's throne. But because Joseph isn't the biological father, the child does not have Joseph's bloodline. Now, we can talk about Mary's gene genealogy if you want to, but according to Judaism, Jesus, as the adopted son of Joseph, would have the, all the legal rights of a biological heir. So you see, Joseph is not just, he's not just being encouraged to make the marriage happen. He's actually being commanded by God here to take Mary as his wife. So there could be no question as to the legitimacy of Jesus' royal right to the throne. He's being commanded. Now, he went, to, he went to bed, I'm sure, that night after he decided to divorce, and he was feeling shame, um, feeling hurt. He's feeling um, like, what's, what's my public um, perception going to be? This, this woman um, was unfaithful to me. And then he receives a dream and a very direct command from God. One more thing to, to note here is that God hasn't spoken. God's been silent for over 400 years at this time. Right? The last known prophet we have in the Old Testament is Malachi. 
the first prophet in the New Testament is John the Baptist, which this is, this is roughly 30 years you know, or so before uh, we see that ministry. So the dream of Joseph is taking place um, during a time when, when nobody has heard God speak, right? And not just Joseph. I mean, nobody has heard a direct message from God in, in quite some time. God had to choose a man that in his lifetime he never heard God speak. His relatives had never heard, of God, heard God speak. People he knew, unless you're over 400 years old, had never heard God speak, right? And so he has to choose a man who would believe the voice of God when he hears it, who would be sensitive to the voice of God, who wouldn't dismiss this as just a dream, right? Um, he had to choose a man who would understand certain prophecies that need to be fulfilled in order for uh, this to prove that it's the Messiah. He, he needed to choose a man who knew the scriptures. Um, verse 23 is a direct prophecy or is a prophecy from God through the prophet Isaiah it says, behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God, or sorry, Joseph had to have knowledge of this prophecy. He had to have knowledge of these scriptures in order to not only believe on it or believe what, what the angel was telling him, but to believe this is a message from God and, and then, of course, have the faith to act on it. So what does, Matt, or what does Joseph do? We read in verses 24 and 25, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So we know Joseph had to be obedient to God's command. Part of, part of the series, what Shane's been talking about, um, in case you've missed the last couple of weeks, is he's, he's been talking about being uh, quietly living out the holiday season, right? So we can create space for God. Um, so we can create space to encounter God. And, and Joseph never speaks a word in Scripture. We don't, we don't have any uh, uh, spoken word of Joseph. You see a quiet man who encountered God and is living out um, what it is that he was commanded to do. He receives the instructions. He simply obeys. We read about faith that can move mountains. This is the kind of faith that we read about that can move mountains. Um, he has knowledge of the prophecy about a virgin having a baby, and he takes Mary as his wife, knowing full well that there's going to be public shame that comes with this, right? They're, they're, they're not going to understand that this baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Um, Joseph has a direct dream. He knows the consequences, and he says, I'm going to do it. Uh, that's true faith. That's, that's, a, that's a, a righteous man, and the Scriptures tell us that Joseph was a righteous man. Um, Remember, this is before the New Covenant, right? This is, this is before the, the, the Jesus' work on the cross. And so I, I found a really good definition that I like about what it meant to be righteous uh, at that time. And it said, someone who not only possessed faith in God, but also demonstrated it through their actions. Someone who trusted God and exhibited integrity, honesty, compassion, and obedience to God's commands. The righteous would seek to please God in all they did and would strive to live a life that reflected their devotion to him. God had commanded Joseph to take Mary as his wife. We see Joseph showed integrity. He was honest. He was extremely compassionate. And above all, he was obedient to God's commands. These are the, the characteristics that we read about of what made a righteous man. Joseph, instead of showing up at Mary's house with a divorce certificate, shows up to take her home to be with him. Verse 25 says that he knew her not until she had given birth. Now, we shouldn't miss that Joseph shows incredible restraint here, right? He shows restraint and obedience even in this decision because when he takes Mary into his house, he has the husbandly right to consummate that marriage 
with Mary at that time. But he doesn't. And that's because he knows that prophecies say that Mary's virginity needs to remain intact through the pregnancy. Again, he shows that he is a righteous man. He demonstrates this through his actions. He trusted God and he was obedient. Before the New Covenant, we read about a lot of righteous men in, in the scriptures. Abraham, Noah, um, Job, just to name a few. We should include Joseph in that list. Joseph truly was a righteous man. So, what is it that God looks for in an adoptive father? For his son. God chose a man who held the justice, but he did so with grace and mercy. He chose a man who would be sensitive to his own voice, who would understand when he is speaking and wouldn't just dismiss the dream as a dream, right? He chose a man who was knowledgeable in the scriptures and about the prophecies foretold in the scriptures. He chose a man that was righteous, and he chose a man that would obey what God was telling him to do. So what does this mean for us? What can we learn from Joseph and take away? Well, if you're a parent, I think you can certainly relate to this. You see, we've been, if you're a parent, you've been given a gift, and that gift is a child. That is a gift from God. Um, he's given parents incredible responsibility because God views children as, as very precious, and he commands us to raise those children to know him. Now, we should obey him in this command. We need to be very intentional, intentional about our children knowing the Lord. We're given that responsibility to raise them to know him. And in doing so, I believe that God wants us to be fair with our children. And he wants us to, be, to show justice with our children. But he wants us to show it while being full of grace and mercy. He also wants us to be sensitive to his instructions. He wants us to develop the same characteristics that he chose in selecting Joseph. But what if you don't have children? What does this mean for you? Well, if you're a Christian and you truly believe that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, then you should know that we've been tasked with raising each other. We've been tasked with raising and discipling one another. We should all love one another, but we should also be full of truth and grace and mercy. We should be very sensitive to the Word of God because we have the Word of God in full. And we should make it a point to study that Word together through fellowship, uh, through dedicated time in the Word. Now, we know that we're made righteous by the New Covenant. right? We're made right by the works of Jesus and nothing that we do. However, the Bible is very clear that faith without works is dead. And Joseph was a righteous man, and through the work of Jesus, we are called righteous too. So let's let our lives show that we've been transformed by the saving grace of God, and let us strive to be more like the forgotten man in the nativity. Let's all try to be a little more like, G or like Joseph. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, uh, first of all, Father, we thank you for the, the children today, that you've uh, uh, <clears throat> spoken through them, through song and through word, Lord, that uh, we, can, we can just know uh, your story. We can know your birth story. We can know the magnitude of what it meant um, at the time and what it continues to mean uh, until now and forever, Lord. We know that... Uh, it changed the course of history. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, just coming and taking uh, on the flesh of man and taking our place on the cross, Lord, to, to, to die in our place, uh, take on our sins. Uh, it's just an incredible gift, Lord. It started uh, with you as the gift that Christmas morning. Lord, we pray that uh, we will never forget that. We also pray 
uh, that we could just uh, be more like Joseph, Lord. I pray that uh, we could obey your commands, that we could uh, just show this compassion and this love and this uh, grace and mercy while also being uh, truthful and, and just, Lord. We pray that uh, we could just uh, show these characteristics. We, we see the way that you and why you chose Joseph, Lord. We, we thank you for choosing us and the positions you've, you've put us in. Uh, we just pray that uh, through your spirit, through your power, that we can continue to uh, uh, grow in, in, in you, Lord. We, we thank you for this time, and uh, we just uh, pray now for uh, everybody here and uh, all the people said, amen. I think that's it. Uh, normally, we do an, a time of offering, but uh, we're not doing that today. So thank you, everybody. Again, thank you for coming, and uh, you are dismissed. Thank you.